For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The word for world doesn't refer to every individual in it. The word cosmos, you can hear its base, for example, in the English word cosmetic, an adornment, something that's beautifying. Let me give you an example. You see, the Christian life is, among other things, it beautifies civilization. It brings a new way of living, and people look at you as the Christian, and they say, you know, he or she, they have something. I don't have that. Well, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory, a, the Holy Spirit who quickens you, brings a way of life that you take for granted, perhaps, but others know nothing of. We're dealing in this last lesson with aesthetics. Think of the word beauty, or its opposite, ugly. But as Dr. Robert Morey is about to teach us, the Christian life, well, God's interested in aesthetics, too. We hear a lot about God's interest in the heart, and the world around us doesn't concern him so much. It does. Let me give you one example. Bob's wife. She wrote a book, The Biblical Discipleship Program for Women. It teaches women, it beautifies women in ways that, that brings an adornment to their marriages to their lives as mothers, to grandmothers' lives, and to the children. There's a different way of life, perfected, I don't mean perfection, but matured in the Christian life. We're going to talk about aesthetics. Now, on the opposite, we have, well, Bob's book, on Bible handbook on slander and gossip. We all know how ugly slander and gossip is. In fact, it's murder on the installment plan. You tear a man or woman down over time. It's just a different form of murder. So you have a contrast. You have a way of life that beautifies the home, beautifies and adorns marriage, beautifies the community. Or you have a way of life that's murderous, maligning, wicked. Well, of aesthetics. I'm amazed you put that in your lectures. Actually, I'm not amazed. I know you well enough to know. Very few theologians even deal with the subject. No, uh, including the philosophers don't well, deal Well, that's it. different. But I mean theologians as a formal branch no. of, they just don't want to deal with it. They don't know anything about it. They've never thought about beauty and ugliness. They've never thought about art and the Bible. Uh, this is where I praise God for my training on Hans Ruckmacher, mm -hmm. the uh, head of the history of art of the University of Amsterdam, and then also Francis Schaeffer, uh, who did much uh, to awaken my understanding of art and How should we then live? Yes, yeah, and uh, giving lectures on it. And to realize the subject of beauty is in the Bible. And it is part of the perspective of how God redeems us from the ugliness of sin to the beauty of righteousness. We're called gold. Yeah. First Peter compares what he does in us to gold. To gold. And the evil, the sinful, to dross. Yeah. In sanctification, the beautiful. We are, in fact, in the Old Testament, there are vessels that were of gold. We're compared to those vessels, except we're in a much greater temple. It's the one throughout the entire earth. And what we as Christians have to do, living in a secularized age, when we ask, does beauty exist? The majority will say no. Because it's relative to the eye of the beholder that is you. What is beautiful for you can be ugliness to me. And that's why you can have in New York City an exhibit of a nude man on a gurney with pig entrails and the uh, organs put on top of him and splashed with blood and that's called art. That's called art. As, as 
just in the study of civilization as an historian, I've noted, you've certainly noted the same thing. We've had long discussions. That when theology is abandoned and secularized philosophy raises its ugly head and the ethics that follows that, we find that beauty gets relativized. It gets changed into what we would consider to be ugly. And not only relativized, they turn it into ugliness so that something is ugly uh, they want to call beautiful, and that which is beautiful, they want to call ugly. Right. But you must understand beauty does exist. We have an objective standard as given in Scripture, and such questions as a member of uh, college, if a uh, flower blooms in the desert and no human being sees it, is it beautiful? I raised my hand and I said yes, because God sees it. Because the standard of beauty is in the mind of God and revealed yes. in Scripture and seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Yes. His we, work, his ethical work. You know, wherever Christians go, yeah, the, it, missionaries, let's say. Yes. Where they go, they beautify, they clean. I love the word clean. I've always loved they that word. They clean it up. They clean up the mind by their preaching, of course. Yep. Now, I'm not talking about perfection, but that isn't all that get, gets cleaned. Hygiene, community hygiene personal hygiene, filth and dirt and debris washed away, um, clothing, covering, nakedness, thought, adornments, even the monuments, the structures, the paintings, the music well, look becomes at the objectively... The become, Della Ropia that's release. right. Look at the cathedrals. Look at even what uh, da Vinci did. And you see the Christian world and life view that has the solution to evil is in the plan of, plan of God, that art should reflect creation, the beauty of it, so you can have a landscape painting. The fall, art should also express the horror of the wickedness and the darkness of sin, the hopelessness and redemption. Right. You know, it used to be in ancient societies, in teaching ancient history, you can go back, you look, I like, as you do, go back to original source material. Yeah. Read what they said back there, where we have it available. One of the descriptions that comes up, you'll find in the camps of armies like Alexander's and uh, other Babylonians, the Assyrians, and in their streets is filth, dung, human excrement, urination. Um, in Deuteronomy, now, you might laugh at first when I bring up a simple passage in the law of God. In Deuteronomy, God said he wanted the men to be equipped with a paddle so they would dig a hole outside, outside the camp outside and the they camp. would bury their human refuse. Now, you say, well, what's that got to do with beauty? Oh. Tell you what it has to do with beauty. The principle of burying that which is ugly, putrid, and in fact dangerous bacterially God wasn't going to get into a whole description on hygiene and, bac and biochemistry, microbiology. He simply they said bury it. wouldn't understand it. He That's said right. simply, don't do bury it, it in the village, the town, the camp, right. and bury it. The Jewish people knew that. They didn't know why necessarily, but in obedience, you don't throw human refuse in the streets. Okay. Well, now transfer that to the Western, Western civilization that adopted these principles first among the nations. What we have done, again, don't laugh, this is very serious. You combine the issue of cleansing with water and burial. Maybe we ought to marvel a little bit more of those that thought through the Christian standard of both in a simple flushing of the toilet. But it keeps our civilization clean. It helps rid of bacteria. A simple precept like that in the mind of God carried forward has helped us be a hygienically clean people. Now, what happens now? As a civilization turns, the, As the, goes the back to civilization evil. turns its back upon the Bible and upon God, ugliness becomes the rule, not beauty. Right. As they no longer accept the sovereignty of God, and that he is in control of history, and God is not a God of chaos but of order, they have to produce music that reflects their worldview, which is free will, chance, and luck. Jackson Pollock is an example. 
and he wanted to do art that would express the randomness, that there is no order to the universe, so he tied some cans to the ladders, uh, the handles on a ladder that were put up high on a string, hit them with a, uh, like an ice pick so they would begin to drip, and then just had them swinging yeah. wildly. But you see, it still didn't work. Right. The cans were swinging according to the laws of thermodynamics, physics, the physics right. and gravity. He wanted to show art that was pure chance. He couldn't do that in the end. That's right. The same thing with those who would throw something up against a, a canvas so that uh, there was a rebellion against beauty and you had the uh, Impressionists, and then you ended up with Gauguin, and you ended up with paintings. It could say a nude descending the stairs, and you don't see a nude or the stairs. <laughs> and you begin to have ugliness, and you see the young people today embracing that which makes them ugly, right? repulsive with all of the piercings and all of the tattoos. Varied colors through it, hair. Co and it, it simply means this. I've said to this one young lady who dyed her hair so she could look like Raggedy Ann, I guess. Remember that from childhood? I do. You would look so much better without that. She said, well, that's why I dyed it. And you see, when our young people today, when they dress a certain way, do their hair, they want to be ugly. That is a repudiation of God's order, which says that we need to beautify the beauty of holiness, the beauty of a Christian home. Take music, for example. John Cage produced a record that when you put on the needle, there's nothing but the scratches, called silence. He said, we have to understand there is no God. The universe is silent. So he produced it, there's nothing. Or he went and sat at a piano to play. And he didn't play, but folded his hands. I know a case where a Christian friend of mine he was an expert musician, and he had around, he taught music, and he had students, and they were, I guess, sitting in a coffee shop, and they were sitting around him, and they were making fun of this Christianity, and they made fun of the fact that as a Christian and music didn't seem to go hand in hand, and he said, did I miss something, or did you miss, excuse me, did you miss something in our lecture? And they looked at him funny. He said, Whose music is a standard? Is it not Handel? Bach? And they, Mendelssohn? Yeah, Handel is the, actually, the, the, they all acknowledge that's the standard. Yeah, yeah. And you have Bach, and you have, but Handel, the Christian man, yeah. and Bach, Johann Sebastian, and they were silenced and ashamed. He said they were ashamed. They were ashamed. Because yeah. they mock a man for his Christian, his views on music, when the very standard they were taught by other professors, yeah, as well as by him, it's Handel himself. And Handel was a Christian man. Well, you can have some forms of so-called modern music. Ski ha, yeah. ee, ha, yeah. ee. right. It's ugliness. It's disjointed. It's disjointed. It doesn't land. It gives something that's disconcerting. It gives a depression. And you can have music. I had a, a roommate in college. Tremendous problem with depression. I said, Joe, you're always depressed. What kind of music do you listen to? Uh -huh. Well, he was listening to this crazy stuff. And I said, what I want you to do is start listening to some of the classical and some of the good Christian hymns. Mm -hmm. He did so. His depression left. I believe that in a home, you raise your children with good Christian music. I took my kids to the Metropolitan Opera. 
My daughter went on to become piano performance and voice. We did that deliberately because we believe in art. Okay. That when we have beauty, that is a biblical standard, it means harmony. See, in the biblical teaching, uh, beauty meant harmonious, uplifting. The effect of art should be to lead you to God, to right. lead you to righteousness. That which is ugly leads you to riot. As a father, one of the things I wanted to do and, and did do, especially with two of our sons, um, at night, very low, so they could get to sleep, obviously, we put on Christian hymns, the historic, the great hymns of the yeah. faith. Not this and modern rock no, and roll that no, is I not beautiful. It's frankly, may I tell you, the Seven Elevens are ugly. The great Christian hymns, but distant so they wouldn't be kept up. Yes. But nonetheless, they go to sleep, which with the kind of hymnology that elevates the soul, elevates its thinking. Yeah. Elevates the comfort of the soul, the orderliness of it. Yeah. Max Weber, that same Weber yeah. thesis in the introduction stated in the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, he said, my discourse is about economics. He's dealing with how Christianity, Christian doctrine promotes sound and honest and effective business ethics. But in his introduction, he said, you can take the same kind of uh, understanding when it comes to music. He said, all societies have a version of music, but only Western society in the Protestant understanding of that and he went through a series of descriptions on harmonies, you know, the the uplifting of the, of the uh, lyrics themselves. He described them scientifically, and he said, this is not what my thesis is about. But in all areas of society where Christianity goes, that's what follows when the Bible is used. He wasn't even, shall we say, the most consistent Christian by any means. He's just an honest historian. These are the results. Yes. That's the adornment. God so loved the cosmos, a form of life so gorgeous that he sent his son to die for it in our lives that we might, by our hands, put something in place that reflects his glory. Bob, your, your lectures do that. They clean people up. They edify them. They build them. Those truths are necessary for this day. The truths that God has solved the problem of evil. When the world says, what about the problem of evil? No, I don't have a problem with evil. God has solved it. Right. He's going to redeem what is going to be redeemed, and the rest he's going to quarantine. <laughs> now, where will you be right. redeemed or quarantined? And they may not like God's way, but may I tell you the plan of salvation is so wonderful. It's beautiful. You know, blessed in the sight of the Lord of the death of the saints. When a Christian dies, it's beautiful. In your death in the afterlife, you make that very point. A work that discourses on well, we all we're all going to face it. Yeah, unless the Lord returns, we'll all we're have all to We're all going to face this. That's right. There is an afterlife that's going to be. It's beyond description. Yeah. It's gorgeous. It is beyond our capacity to understand it at this point. Yeah. Um, death in the afterlife describes for the Christian the fact that death is a portal. It's a, go it's a door. It's a door to the greatest adventure, eternal life, in Jesus Christ, our eternity. Well, you However, see, the unbeliever, oh the my. tragedy, you said quarantine. They're frightened of it because Scared they have death. no confidence. Um, I'll show you the difference. Uh, scripture says, O death, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? Right. And this little boy was outside playing in the yard. I don't know if you did this as a kid, but I even <laughs> did it. Yep. And there was a trellis with flowers and there were honeybees. And I went over a couple of times and flicked the bee. <laughs> yep. You ever flicked a bee? Oh, yeah. All right, everybody yeah. does it. And this boy flicked a bee, and this bee got up. Mm -hmm. 
came right at him. And the boy started shouting. He knew he was in for it. He ran to the back door. He opened the screen door, went right in, but the bee made it inside too. <laughs> Mama was at the sink washing dishes, and he shouted, the bee, the bee, the bee. She lifted up her apron, mm -hmm. put it over him. The bee landed on Mama's arm dug its sting in, pulled it out, and then started flying. And the boy said, I hear the bee, the bee. He yep. said, honey, you don't have to be afraid of the bee. Its sting is in mommy. Mm -hmm. Christ took the sting of death for himself. So when right. death buzzes at me, as it has, I don't fear death. Death is the ferryman to take me to the celestial city. And you see, even the death of the saints is viewed in Scripture it's as precious. beautiful. Pre Not that's as right. evil, but as beautiful right. and precious because it is a portal into the very presence of God. That's right. Now, for an unbeliever who doesn't have faith in anything but himself, he has no such hope. He has no such hope in he has life no solution, or in death. And he has no solution. No for solution the, to the problem. Same thing with these the aberrant theologies today. Right. The open view, middle knowledge, uh, all of these uh, denials uh, of Paul's justification, new view, all of these modern heretical movements, they have no solution to the problem of evil. They leave you hanging with a God who did not know, a God who did not care, and a God who did not do anything. And they discount their problem until they have to face death itself or the death of a loved one. At that point, they have no real solution in their philosophies. They fall to the ground. I'm going to mention an outstanding work on the Trinity. And Bob, you wrote this. We have, we haven't emphasized the phrase throughout these lessons, but I'd like you to, I'd like you to learn our worldview. We've used worldview enough times. Ours is a Trinitarian worldview. Our view of the world emanates from the mind of the triunity of the Godhead. Father, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons. They are distinct each of them fully God. In their union, they are a full worldview and much more that we, don't, we will learn in eternity. We have a Trinitarian worldview that beautifies the world. Be it the hygiene in the camp or in the city, be it the cleanliness of the body, the washing of our, of our bodies, the, the removal of debris and filth, be it the cleansing of the mind where lust is to be repented of. Be it the clothing we wear, the art forms you've spoken of, the music that we play, the society, a civilization adorned by the name of Jesus Christ. That's aesthetics. That emanates from a Trinitarian worldview. It's not man's concoction. It flows out of the very nature of God the glory of his son who brought it to us that he might bring that glory to the Godhead and therefore we enjoy it and enjoy him forever. I once sat with an unsaved professor from a college and he said explain to me what you believe and I began at the beginning and did creation, fall, redemption, and how we're chosen by the Father, right. purchased by the Son, sealed by the Spirit, blessed God, three in one. And when I finished, his remark was, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. It's a Trinitarian worldview. The biblical view of salvation is right damn beautiful. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Him that cometh unto me, I, I will in no wise cast out. out. And so it is that the Father is given the precedence, not that he is, not that he is greater as God, but the other 
two members of the Trinity have voluntarily submitted under his authority. In the economical Trinity. The economical Trinity. They're God all work. equal. God at work. Yes. The Father and the Son have covenanted to secure my soul. They agreed in the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit would be sent, and he voluntarily subscribed to that. And now he has sent and brings me, has brought me to Jesus Christ. We call that the economical trinity. Perhaps that's something we'll ask Dr. Bob to bring to us in a second, chart a second mind map. Because ultimately, there's an ever grown, there's a maturation in these doctrines. I'd like to encourage you, though, Study the mind map that's provided in your set. Go over these, these lessons. Go through them over and over. Study the scriptures that have been brought as a commentary. From an aesthetic point of view, given the power of the Holy Spirit, he'll beautify your life. He'll beautify a problem that you may, or you may have with your tongue. Slander, lying, gossip cursing. He'll beautify the mind as you learn to wrestle against lust and the fallenness of our thinking. He'll replace it with truths where Christ is preeminent. It's obvious from Dr. Bob's teaching, the mind map that Christ is preeminent in this great teacher. And your family can become beautiful. And your family. And you know, if we have enough of those your marriage, fam beautiful. your marriage, your children, if we have enough young people, what about our country? Maybe our country can be secured again. Maybe we Nineveh. We had a beautiful country. We did. Despite but our sins. The relativism, the uglification of those who are in charge of fashions to make women look like men and men to look like women, to uglify women with the most ridiculous clothing. Uh, when you look at the fashions that are passed off, they're right down ugly. Look right at our, down ugly. Look at our nation, a nation that teaches in its government school system that Jesus Christ is not a proper role model for our kids. We subject our kids, many people, I, there are those that don't, but many people subject their children to a, an atheistic worldview in the public schools where they learn to be successful, if they are, in a Christless manner. Christless becomes the ethic. And if they're successful, it's Christless. And if they're not successful, it's Christless. Either way, it's without Christ. A Trinitarian worldview starts at the beginning. You just heard the doctor. It starts with the triunity of the Godhead and works then through the lives of the individuals, their homes, their families, their churches, and ultimately, our nation. And you've brought, we have brought evil down to where we live. See, the, the philosophy of evil, the quote problem of evil, it's not some esoteric philosophic thing dealing with some ethereal kind of evil. It's dealing with the ugliness in our lives which only Jesus Christ can cure. With that, Dr. Bob, thank you so much. God bless you.